Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Grand Rounds today. Uh, I'm uh, Tom Farden, and I'm the organizer and chair of Grand Rounds. This week, uh, focus on climate change and sustainability. Uh, you'll be aware that we have linked up with the sustainability stroke uh, global citizenship team with uh, Leslie Crichton, who co-chairs Grand Rounds with me, um, and with Anne Monroe Stewart one of the GPs locally who takes the lead on sustainability. And they have uh, helped us to insert more of this sustainability, global citizenship type themes throughout our Grand Round program. So I'm grateful to both Leslie and Monroe for helping organize uh, this specific talk today. Um, we were due to be joined uh, by, uh, by a second person today who's going to talk about procurement in endoscopy, but fortunately can't make it because of clinical pressures. So. I'm pleased to welcome as the sole speaker today is Rosie Haddock, who I've just discovered um, is an ST6 in gastroenterology from the West Coast uh, in Glasgow. And she has been here for nearly 12 months as the endoscopy fellow in the gastroenterology department here in NHS Tayside. She is gonna to speak today about climate change and sustainable endoscopy. So without further ado, I'll hand over to Rosie. Any questions you have, please put them in the chat or hang on till the end where we'll be able to have a discussion um, uh, about this topic. Thank you very much, Rosie. Looking forward to hearing from you. Yeah, thanks for asking me to speak. Um, it's quite a niche topic, I think, even in the world of gastroenterology, it's quite a, a sort of a, a, a niche topic, but um, some of the things I'll talk about are applicable to other specialties, um, particularly sort of from the quality improvement side. Um, so I'm just going to do a quick, um, sorry, let me just, a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about. So um, just an introduction to climate change. I'm hoping that most people will know about this already, but maybe not. Um, the problem in endoscopy and then how we can possibly change um, and not solve the problem, but improve the problem. Um, and then talk a bit about sustainable quality improvement, just give an example of a, of a, of a sustainable quality improvement project endoscopy. So um, just start with introduction um hopefully i say everyone knows about this already um climate change is a public health emergency um greatest lancer has called it the greatest global health opportunity but also the greatest global health threat of the 21st century um, and it's not going to go away and um, so i feel as healthcare professionals we all need to address it start thinking about it and addressing it we have the paradox of healthcare cause causing climate change um for example, healthcare accounts for about 5% of national yearly carbon emissions. And um, however, climate change worsens health outcomes. So um, there's a concentrate on gastroenterology, but you've got food insecurity and air pollution is a big thing. Um, particularly I saw in London, they would they advise people not to exercise outside last week because the air pollution was so bad. Um, and it's predicted to cause more deaths than infectious diseases by or malignancy by um, 2100. And actions needed to help mitigate climate change will also have a positive, very positive public health impacts, such as things like active travel, um, you know, eating more plant-based based diet, etc. So this is just a wee uh, sort of photo, um, photo scheme of a matter of what's um, the different health um, effects of climate change. Um, as you can see, there's quite, quite a lot. Some of them, yes, you might say, might say not applicable to us right now. Things like vector-borne diseases and water and food supply. But you know, in the future, we don't know that may well happen. Um, this happened this year. So 200 plus medical journals all published this article um, in uh, all at the same time, um, which was a, a quite a, you know it was a not not done before. Um, which basically is quite a short article, it's worth reading. Um, basically, the summary is that the global tar targets currently, even at the COP, are not enough. Um, wealthy nations need to do more. The global north is responsible for 92% of all emissions. Um, and there's basically saying there's a continued failure, failure of global health leaders to, to address the problem. So it's quite scathing, but it's also quite I mean, encouraging that sort of over 200 journals have published it. Um, more locally, um, NHS Scotland seems to be taking a, a slightly more proactive approach. They brought forward the net zero carbon um, the carbon net zero date to 2040 rather than 2050, which I think is NHS England's. Um, and that includes no carbon offsetting, which is quite a big deal. 
they've said in their consultation that clinicians must be involved um, and that about 80% of the carbon health's carbon footprint can be apportioned to clinical choices. Um, and each health board um, will need to put in place a climate emergency, emergency response and a sustainability team. So that's the next four years. Um, and then just a bit about endoscopy. So endoscopy is the um, generator of, highest generator of waste and CO2 emissions in healthcare. Um, so obviously surgery, ICU, um, anaesthetics are ahead of us, um, but actually they are doing a lot, um, a lot to, you know, at the moment to try and help quite a lot of publications out about surgery and stuff, about reusable equipment. And so we f I think in endoscopy, we need to follow suit. Um, reasons for this, so we have a high caseload, a lot of energy use, decontamination of the scopes, lots of waste streams, patients have to come to hospital to get the scope. Um, and then obviously, like the whole NHS, you've got the supply chain of the procurement emissions. Um, and then you've also got, as well as carbon emissions, you've got the plastic waste and the water contamination from all the chemicals we use. <clears throat> so the pandemic has shown that we can rapidly change practices. Um, you know, for example, um, all specialties have um, you know, remote consultations, changes in vetting processes, online meetings and conferences. However, although carbon emissions did reduce during the peak and you know, when there's national lockdowns, last year they only reduced carbon by five to six percent and we need a yearly eight percent reduction to meet any kind of CO2 targets. Um, so sustainability must be part of the pandemic recovery. So how can endoscopy be made greener? Um, again, with anything, doing less procedures um, emits less carbon, and that's a, a pretty standard approach. Um, can we make the procedures greener, so reducing the carbon footprint of the procedure? Can we lobby industry and procurement and change that? Um, and then you know, research projects and QI projects uh, must be part of this. So doing fewer procedures will have the greatest impact. Um, a fifth of what we do in healthcare isn't needed and medical excess harms patients, it costs more and increasing spending does not necessarily equal better outcomes. So in general, as an, endos as an endoscopy department, avoiding things like doing an OGD just for dyspepsia, um, very, very low yield, and doing colonoscopy for constipation. So these are things that are nationally and internationally sort of identified that don't need to be done. Um, Enhanced and very thorough vetting processes are something is a really good way of reducing um, few reducing number of procedures. And then excitingly in gastroenterology, we have got quite a few low, you know, low carbon alternatives. So the fit test, um, fecal hemoglobin quantification can rule out significant pathology. Side sponge, we're looking at that, and that might potentially reduce the amount of Barrett's and surveillance scopes we need to do. And then um, is always a good thing as well. So this is just an example of, I think, of what needs to happen more in the research world of medicine. We get guidelines all the time saying, oh, you must do this, you must do this, all the things that we must do. And as practitioners, it were very easy to persuade to do something. This is just an interesting um, guideline from the European site of gastroenterology, and it talks about things that do not need to be done. So, for example, do things that do not need do, do not require surveillance. There's quite a few um, things that we've been looking at recently about what not to biopsy, um, and I think more um, stringent research needs to be done about this kind of thing because it's a lot harder for practitioners to to not do something than to do something. And but if we have guidelines showing that we don't have to do something, then I think that makes it a lot easier. Um, this is just other things from a more general perspective. Um, NICE does have a database of things that shouldn't be done. Um, and I found this recently, it's quite interesting. There's a new podcast which offers ways to reduce medical excess, which is just different specialties talking about different, you know, giving examples about how medical excess has been reduced. Now doing greener procedures. So this has been looked at quite a lot in the surgical side as well. Um, Waste segregation and you know triaging um, waste appropriately is one really big thing, which um, and it's quite an easy win um, that can be done. Um, you know, making everything, everything electronic um, is better. Um, putting recycling bins, education, education about what goes in which bin, 
using reusable items is something which is being looked at at the moment, particularly on the surgical side. Um, you know, lobbying companies to use compostable plastic, and then particularly for us, you reducing nitrous oxide use. So just quickly about nitrous oxide, it's really, really potent greenhouse gas. We use it for some of our colonoscopy because it is a good analgesia. It is a bigger problem in anaesthetics and in agriculture. Um, but we, um, it's just been aware of, of the potential environmental impact. There's some arguments that we should stop using it, but actually it is good for patients because it means that they can get away if they don't have anyone to bring, bring them back or take them, um, to take them home. So it is of benefit to patients, but it's just something that um, we are aware of. And actually, some hospitals have got machines that supply it and you, know, you need to check them for leaks and things. We just use canisters, which is actually easy to turn on and off. Um, segregation. So staff understanding is very, very poor of this. So there's a study of about a thousand endoscopists and it showed only 0.6 understood what, understood what waste goes in which bin. Um, infectious waste often in hospitals makes up no more than 10 to 25 percent but in many the actual um, infectious waste is a lot more um, and it is cheaper so it's a lot more expensive to incinerate the orange bags than just just to throw away the black ones um, the choice of waste stream does have a 50 fold impact on the carbon footprint so there's this graph here which shows um, the you know kind of the differences in carbon emissions um, from the different bags and um, so it's a really 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 high you know really really massive difference um from you putting those wrappings in the orange bin rather than the black bin and this is just an example of um you know quite a sort of a thorough table about what goes where and this is from a different different health board in england just an example of what could be what could be done um there's a machine called a SteriMelt, which I think is used down south, where you can recycle sterilization, you can recycle wraps and drapes and face masks um, and gowns. Um, and you place them in a SteriMelt machine and basically creates these blocks of plastic and they can then be sold to companies to reuse. I'm not sure how successful they have been down south in actually getting rid of the blocks of plastic, but it, it's just been something that's been, you know, um, that's been touted as an idea for a circular economy. And then water usage um, is a big thing in endoscopy. Um, we use a lot of water per decontamination cycle. We often put sterile water into parts of the body that are not sterile, which is an ongoing debate. Um, so we use those sort of sterile saline bottles and use them to like flush the scopes, put, you know, flush stuff into the stomach or the colon and it doesn't at all. Um, unfortunately, the reason why that has to be done is because of industry and warranties and stuff, which we're trying to change at the moment. Her tap water has been approved with this sort of with this um, filter on um, to use a sort of in the room to flush the scopes and things. So we're hoping that, that might make a make a difference as well. Biopsies is a big thing. We're working on this at the moment in the endoscopy department. So someone did a study processing three biopsy pots is the equivalent of driving two miles in a car, um, and also causes is a lot of work for this pathologists. Um, in general, a lot of low yield upper GI biopsies are taken. Um, I'm looking at this at the moment in, in the department um, and hoping to reduce the amount of biopsies that we take. Um, from a polyps perspective, we're hoping that in future, maybe artificial intelligence might help them identify low risk polyps that we can just leave or take away and not send to histopathology. Um, so that's something that might potentially happen in the future. And then procurement is the biggest carbon emitter of the of the NHS. Um, and so, um, you know, as gas gastroenterologists, we feel we should use our purchasing power or lobby industry to start using more sustainable supplies and practices, you know, using recycled plastic, less packaging, um, compostable plastic, etc. Um, and also pressure companies to and disclose their carbon status and the climate policies. Um, and then obviously using domestic manufacturers is, is better as well. Single use endoscopies is a big contentious area in gastroenterology. I know some of the specialties use, um, already use single use endoscopies and single use scopes of urology, ENT, et cetera. Um, there's been some studies that show doing ERCP, genoscopes, 
in, causes infection transmission and that has been really sort of propagated by industry um however there's been some studies out recently showing that the single-use endoscopies have a really negative environmental impact and need to be you know used very carefully and it's quite an ongoing controversial debate of which there's not much evidence for at the moment so just sort of reflecting on different things that can be done um sort of looking at individual departmental level there are things that level is quicker change you, you might seem feel like it's not going to do much good and um, but it's more manageable and less daunting um you can do smaller qi projects um lead by personal example however from a profession-wide body things like um national body support which we are fortunate to have in gastro georgia the bsg have been really proactive in this um Royal College of Physicians have divested from fossil fuels, which is exciting. Um, an increased focus on studies tackling medical excess, more um, grants budgets available for this kind of thing. Um, and another thing from our perspective is there's been some um, push forward about green accreditation of endoscopy units. Um, and indeed, as part of our accreditation, there is some of this question that um, needs to be fulfilled is that endoscopy units need to have a green working group, um, which again, promotes this this same um, kind of thing it's just an example the bsg does have a climate change and sustainability strategy which is really um exciting um but unfortunately we're just start of year one at the moment so we've got quite far to go <laughs> things that can be done easily in a department um, any department having a hostile group or committee to lead lead the way forward um at our endoscopy users group we've got a recurrent sort of theme that stays there which is green endoscopy and you know what's been done um Education about waste segregation and recycling um, is relatively easy and it does does make a difference. Having green champions in each department and then putting sustainability at the heart of all local QI projects and usually things that save money also help carbon emissions as well. Um, this is probably more for endoscopists. Um, but things that things that are really quick wins um, kind of are, recycling been thinking about how things will change your management um i know someone's done a study in carbon emissions of the blood tubes that we use um, and we probably take far more blood tests than we actually need to do um so thinking about things like that um, um using less paper um the ink pads that we use and i'm sure other specialties use these as well contain plastic so thinking about what could be used instead and um, putting stickers on bins to show the correct um, waste streams, thinking before you print anything, and planning equipment usage before opening, which hopefully everyone does, but I'm sure some people don't. Now, thinking about quality improvement, um, the so Centre for, for Sustainable Healthcare have got a really good website called SusQI, in which outlines how to do a quality improvement project and putting sustainability at the heart of it. So use this sort of triple bottom line method, which not only looks at outcomes for patients and financial costs of a project, but it also looks at the environmental and social cost. So an example, um, you know, that we, that's, um, I'm not sure if this has been done here, this is just given in a, in a, um, a talk that I looked at recently, um, but having a, a nurse-led phone triage for colonoscopy referrals in patients at the age of 80, where they are high perforation, and the patient outcomes from that would be, you know, possibly increased satisfaction, avoid more invasive tests, financial costs is hopefully fewer procedures. Um, it empowers socially, it empowers the patients to make a choice. They don't necessarily have to travel to clinic um, if they don't, um, you know, if they are, get phone triage or if they don't come and get the colonoscopy. Um, and from an environmental perspective, there's fewer procedures um, and there's no travel. Um, and this also incorporates realistic medicine which I think is um, you know, quite important Scottish governmental thing. Um, again, these are just examples of things that could be done in an endoscopy unit to reduce um, uh, you know, quality improvement projects. Things that I think will be harder and will take time and collaboration is, like I talked about before, um, getting some robust, robust research for evidence-based practice. There isn't any out there really. Um, changing the culture, um, you know, we practice very defensive medicine, and how do how do we change that? 
And de-implementation of low-value care, again, is something which maybe COVID has helped with a little bit, but it's not easy to do. Um, procurement, although I think there's been a lot of work put into that, and it's a shame that Andy couldn't come speak to us today about that, because I think he'd be talking a lot more about that. Um, changing industry um, as well will take a lot more time. Um, creating models of best practice. Um, and then paid sessions in job plans, which would be probably the ideal because most people that are doing this kind of thing are doing it in their own time, um, especially for clinicians. Um, barriers to this kind of thing as well, sort of attitudes and behaviours, complacency. People feel like, oh, it's not, I don't, it's not my problem. It's too big of a thing for me to sort out. Um, there's often quite high upfront costs um, to doing a lot of these things, but thinking about longer term goals rather than just short term financial gains. Um, infection control is a big is a big barrier, particularly in endoscopy. And then to say, like I talked about for defensive medicine and a lack of time. I suppose just a few reflections to finish off with. Um, I think, well, I think the status quo is unsustainable at the moment. Um, Things don't need to be perfect and often small changes can have collectively have a big effect. Um, making healthcare more sustainable also saves money and improves health, which is a sort of a triple win situation. Um, it doesn't have to be all or nothing um, on an individual or a collective level. Even doing one change will make a difference. Um, some people think that, someone, you know, what about all the fossil fuel industries uh, it should be, you know, someone else's problem, it's healthcare, but actually I feel like as healthcare professionals, we're used to, you know, being public health advocates and we should be leading the way on it really. Um, and then, you know, one of our one of the bit of the Hippocratic Oath is first do no harm and um, promoting population health and addressing climate change and not mutually exclusive. Um, mm. However, I think that we need more data, we need better outcome measures and a more robust evidence base to do any of this, which I think is a big, a big barrier. And I think that's it. Yeah. So we, anyone's got any questions or anything you want to say? Rosie, thanks very much for that. And um, as you say, it's a shame that Andy couldn't join us to, to talk about the procurement issues, but we are where we are. But that gives us um, some time for questions, comments. Um, there is at least one gastroenterologist in the audience who may have something to add to your, to your talk. Um, and um, there are other people in the audience with an interest in sustainability and, uh, and the like. So any questions from the virtual floor? Stick your hand up or just open your mic. So um, uh, I, I'm a chest physician and I dabble in endoscopy in the form of bronchoscopy. Um, mm -hmm. But we, our volume is is tiny compared to what you do. You know, yeah. we're, we're doing we do four lists a week and you're doing five lists every morning, every afternoon. So we, yeah. we're, a, we're a small but important part of the endoscopy service. Mm -hmm. Um, so I see some of the problem issues that you're talking about. Mm -hmm. it, it never really struck me that we were putting sterile, squirting sterile water and saline into airways, which are in and of themselves not very sterile, um, mm -hmm. and it's probably costing us money. But my, my biggest bugbear is the bins. Yes. I, I put a link in the chat here to, um, to Grand Rounds Past where we've talked about bins, and yet yes. still we're not really getting that. And I think it strikes me that you know simple things like just putting the right stuff in the right bin could be a if we all did that it would be a really big change. Yeah, yeah. I think things like that, yes, um, are helpful, but ultimately it's going to be doing less tests or less doing less will be yeah. actually the, is the best thing. Um, so on that on that on that basis. We, we do far fewer bronchoscopies now than when yeah. I was a trainee. I mean, far, far fewer. Mm -hmm. um, uh, by things like we used to bron do a bronchoscopy in anyone with hemopsis. And yeah. if you do a normal CT scan, then a bronchoscopy adds essentially nothing to that. Yeah. Um, so we've cut down a huge amount on the low yield. Yes. Low likelihood of, of pathology scopes, which reduces risk to sedation, 
reduces risk to the, the of the inherent bronchoscopy and reduce just reduces the, the amount of work we're doing, which is great. But I do know there's an awful lot of screening stuff that goes on in, in particularly on in colons, which has an evidence base, mm. I think. So how do you how do you balance those two things of there's this evidence base that you should you should um, do surveillance on people versus yeah. um, uh, versus oh, we're just doing too many tests and it's too low a yield. I think it's sort of um, trying to sort of target the right things. Targeting something like you know um, like colorectal cancer screening, I think that's probably the wrong thing to target because because it's cancer and it's and and things. And I think what we need to do is target the right things. You know, we're trying to target things like gastrite, like reflux. You know, things that are not going to kill you, um, and um, yeah, just targeting the right thing really because. Um, and I think finding different alternatives. So, you know, for example, we're hoping that side sponge uh, for Barrett screening and for reflux screening will become a, a thing, um, which will like, you know, I think the data that we've got at the moment is that it's re reduced the amount of surveillance scopes of 120 people needed by 90%. So we needed to scope sort of 10 of those people. Um, so hoping that, you know, there'll be alternatives. So I suppose, in, I imagine in, in respiratory, you put you the imaging you have is really good um, compared to we we don't have any cross section imaging. Whether that's better for the environment, or not, I don't know. It probably is because of less waste and stuff involved. But um, it's just having and having an alternative and targeting those areas. I think targeting something like um, you know surveillance for cancer or or, or cancer screening is quite difficult um, because of the emotive side and because of um the, the government either sort of it's quite high up doesn't it so um, yeah and it's a, it's a, it's it's a, a low probability but a high impact thing isn't it that's that's the what yeah we make risk is probability plus impact um so um uh, as you say our cross sectional imaging is excellent and if you put a normal ct scan your chance of having cancer is vanishingly yeah. small um yeah. what we don't know what i don't know is how what the what the um carbon footprint global warming potential of a ct scan is yeah, so totally, i so. don't know if there are any radiologists on the call but that's another you know we may well just be offsetting one one risk yeah. into another risk obviously yeah. mri scans are, and, and require helium to be very very cold and that, that yeah. takes a lot of power so so we may well just be offsetting one thing to another thing yeah. a couple of comments in the in the chat um just read them out um, for comment um to the Strachan in biochemistry says fit testing is available to all GPs in Tayside to help triage uh, and labs are always happy to facilitate less blood testing. I think um, one of our things we've been trying to work on in bronchoscopy for years now is the routine um, clotting te check checks, routinely doing iron out. There's no evidence for it. It's not, it's not needed unless you're yeah. on warfarin or you have a particular reason that you would have an abnormal INR. Um, and 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 measuring it in anybody else is is a waste of a, of a of a test, waste of a blood bottle and some reagents and somebody's time. Yeah. Um, so stopping doing those tests, I think you're right. You know the routine test before a before a different test. Um, and then Kevin McCongle, McCongle who um, works at, uh, as a GP and also in the university, helpful to know direction of travel repatient journey to explain, but in a GP setting, and he reflects uh, in. In sharing a house with a relative in midst of GI investigation at the moment, paperwork, um, yeah. the amount of paperwork, yeah. uh, the appointments and recurring patient info leaflets is filling up his blue bin. I know accessibility and information is important, but the vet sends one text yeah. appointment reminder, presumably for his cat, dog, guinea pig. Although and, uh, we, we need to send out consent. So that's probably that's what the big leaflet is usually is the consent. But yeah, and you, you could argue actually if patients are happy to get it emailed or you know, link to link your know, QR code to something, then that should be something which, you know, again, could be, I'm sure it will, well, NHS, it's always difficult to change in the IT system, but, but um, yes. Okay. So does anyone else have, um, have any comments that they'd like to make um, or any questions for Rosie? I think the, the less blood testing, I reckon that's more of a problem in, from an inpatient perspective as well, like the amount of inpatients that get, I mean, don't get me wrong, there's inpatients that need bloods all the time, but 
you know most inpatients don't need daily bloods do you know what I mean and I think that's maybe it's changed since oh, it's been a year since I've done any inpatient work so maybe it's got better but or maybe it's different better in other hospitals but the amount of people that you just end up bleeding every single day and you know, actually but then that's all about educating usually educating the junior doctors which yeah so lots to work on uh, yeah, lots. in terms of sustainability um and this is a wide-reaching topic uh, we have more talks coming on in grand rounds of the this semester about this uh, with ranging from how do we promote healthy travel to work with cycling to work schemes and building better infrastructure to how do we we've, we've had talks on anesthetic gases and how to improve uh, carbon footprint in theatre and the successes um, that uh, Pavan Bangalore has had uh, leading on that in the in the anesthetic department it's great to hear something from medicine um, in terms of this endoscopy work, it would be nice to get Andy to, to give an update and perhaps I'll get him to record something. We can tag this onto the YouTube channel. Um, and as I say, we have more sustainability chat coming later on in the year. Uh, we'll call it a day there. Rosie, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Discussion. And, um, and if anyone has any other comments or questions, pass them on. I can pass them on to Rosie. And this is the point where I usually tell you uh, what, um, what's coming next week and I can't find my piece of paper. So next week will be a big surprise. <laughs> I, shall, um, I shall certainly email you in the week to tell you what's coming next week. If you would like to speak at Grand Rounds, then please get in touch. We have a slot at the end of March and then slots into May. So if you have a burning topic, then please do uh, get in touch with me um, and we can, uh, we'll take it from there. I've just found the document on my computer so I can tell you who's next week if it loads. Here we go. So uh, next week at Grand Rounds, seamless transition, um, is the University of Dundee Medical School is going to, uh, led by um, Ellie Hothersall, although the speakers are to be confirmed, that uh, the title is the, uh, the University Curriculum Bigger Picture and Decolonizing the Curriculum. So work which is, going, is expanded on uh, the uh, the curriculum review from last year, and also picking up from the grand round, which was um, in the middle of last year, about uh, the decolonizing the curriculum led by some of our students, which was really excellent. And I'll put a link to that presentation on YouTube in the email next week. Thank you very much, everyone. Um, and uh, take care and goodbye.